It was a rainy day in Orangeburg, New York in 2018. Gianluca Barecchia was hanging out in his college dorm room between classes. An Italian flag hung on the wall above his bed as an homage to his Italian family back in Connecticut. North Haven is all Italians, so most of them are actually from the same area in Italy. So everyone always says when they see me around town, who am I not related to? Gianluca was a sophomore nursing major. His courses and exams could be intense, but today he felt unusually tired. And just not really myself. Like I didn't really have much energy in me to do anything that day. And it felt almost like I had a cold too. There was a heaviness in his lungs. It felt like almost like there was an elephant like sitting on my chest. And I was just trying to take like deep breaths, like extremely deep breaths to see if that would kind of clear it up. It didn't work. Maybe I just need a yawn and maybe that'll like help or try coughing it out or something like that. But none of it gave him relief. So he turned to the thing that had been his source of comfort, his electronic cigarette. Without thinking, he took a puff. And then that's when it felt like, I felt like I just couldn't breathe anymore. And it felt like my airway was just like closing almost. My lungs felt like they were on fire. And I was just like coughing. His face began to turn bright red. My roommate, I'll never forget, looked at me and he's like, oh my God, like what's wrong with you? He got so scared. He actually called 911 because that's when I started to kind of go out of it because I couldn't stop coughing. And then, Everything went black. I just hear the ambulance like being jiggled around, going over all these bumps, and I hear the sirens blaring, and I hear the paramedic telling me like, oh, wake up, like, wake up, wake up. He was in the back of an ambulance. There was the paramedic and then an EMT as well. And I had this big oxygen mask on me. I just was terrified, like, oh my God, I'm gonna die. When we got to the hospital, they rushed me right in, and I was surrounded by a doctor and a few other nurses. It was just like pure chaos in this room right now. And you hear like the oxygen just flowing like 100%. The doctor began asking him questions. Like if I did any drugs, he's like, you just need to tell me what you took because God forbid you could die right now. And I don't know what is wrong because you need to be honest and truthful with me because someone your age, this doesn't just happen to just because. John Luca told him, I haven't taken any drugs. And then that's when the question came up about vaping. I was like, well, I do vape. And he's like, what do you use? And I was like, it's called a jewel. And he wasn't the only one. A warning for parents tonight. Do you know if your child is juuling at school? Across the country, high school students have become hooked on a device straight out of Silicon Valley. Another big story tonight, a disturbing study out about teens and vaping, and it shows a significant jump, nearly doubling the number from last year in the number of kids that are actually using these nicotine devices. It ended up becoming my oxygen. I couldn't live without it. I needed it all the time, every day. It would set John Luca and so many others on a path to the highest offices in the land. I wrote an email saying, don't worry, girls, we're gonna share this story in front of a congressional committee. Another topic that has been top of first. mind is yeah, teen yeah. tobacco use, and it is up. And the CDC is blaming who else but Juul. The White House is calling for a ban on nearly all flavored e-cigarettes. These are the flavors that have started this epidemic among young people. And on a collision course with the men behind it. My name is James Monsies. Adam Bowen and I founded Juul Labs. We were going to take on big tobacco who had been killing people and lying about it for a hundred years. I said to myself, this is gonna be a big challenge for me to to manage James through this, and there's no managing James. I remember thinking those smart mother effers, they probably did this on purpose. We never wanted any non-nicotine user, and certainly nobody underage, to ever use Juul products. I just, I wanna tell you, I've been involved with public health for a long time in the Bay Area. You, sir, are an example to me of the worst of the Bay Area. I just remember, like, my heart stopped, like, seeing them. And I just, like, froze. And I was just staring at them when they came in, and I was just like, wow, like, that's the people right there that sent me down my spiral and not even caring about it.
To listen to the Vaping Fix ad-free right now and to new episodes one week early, join Wondery Plus by starting your free trial in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. The Vaping Fix is pleased to have Simply Safe as its presenting sponsor. You've probably heard of Simply Safe. It's an award-winning home security system engineered with the latest technology you want to keep your family safe. But no award can do the hard work of not only keeping you safe, but making you feel safe. For my money, what really sets Simply Safe apart is its people. Highly trained security experts who are always there for you when you need them most. When an alarm goes off, a person who cares is there for you with a phone call to make sure you're okay. When an emergency happens, a person who cares is there for you by getting fire and police responders to your front door right away. In the years I've been using Simply Safe, knowing I've got that kind of support and protection if I need it gives me peace of mind that is truly priceless. To learn more about how Simply Safe can help protect you and your family, visit simplysafe.com/vaping today to customize your system and get a free security camera. You also get a 60-day risk-free trial, so there's nothing to lose. That's simplysafe.com/vaping. V A P I N G. From Wondery, I'm Laura Beal, and this is The Vaping Fix. As a journalist, I hear some pretty disturbing stuff. My inbox isn't exactly a daily avalanche of joy. I'm also the mother of two teenagers, which means I have an infinite capacity to imagine worst case scenarios. I think all parents do. A few years ago, one of my mom friends asked me what I knew about a new kind of vape thing. It had become the latest status symbol at her daughter's school. It was called Jewel. Her daughter didn't think it was a big deal, but my friend was concerned. She thought maybe as a journalist, I knew something about it. I did not. And as a mom, that was a little scary. And that was before I even heard about kids like John Luca. But his story and the story of Jewel are intertwined in unexpected ways. To understand how it all started, we have to go back to two other college students who arrived at a place that had given the world iPhones, microprocessors, and GoPro cameras. They walked the same halls where Bill Hewlett met David Packard, where the founders of Google, Instagram, and PayPal found inspiration. Stanford University, in the heart of Silicon Valley. This is a six-part series about what happens when the spirit of innovation collides with greed, politics, and the unforgiving reality of addiction. This is episode one, Playing With Fire. Stanford University is nestled among the tidy suburbs south of San Francisco. Under its red tile roof, students have come together to dream up radical ideas that have fed the billion-dollar companies that have sprouted up around it. Some have changed the world. Some have made former students astronomically wealthy. A few have done both. And just like on pretty much any university campus, in 2003, you could from time to time see stressed out students huddled outside a building having a smoke. One of them, Sam was in his second year of grad school. I particularly remember after meeting everybody, I was so excited about the program, whether it was their demeanor, whether it was their drawing skills, uh, whether it was their CAD skill or something, something that impressed me about everybody. Sam's not his real name, which he didn't want used. He had arrived on campus to study at the school's design program. He had hopes of turning his engineering degree into art. He dove straight into a hectic schedule of classes and work. He was busy, but every now and then, he would slip out the back door and into the alley. And we had a little staircase, and we'd just kind of sit and talk and, you know, shoot the breeze, have a cigarette break, and then um, get back to work. The smoke breaks were a good place to chat with other students, sort out a problem, or just mentally reset during the pressure of school. I, I remember estimating I was doing about 10 cigarettes a day. So I guess it's half a pack of like prefab, but we were we were always um, rolling because that was cheaper. 
and more gratifying. There were three or four other students who regularly smoked, and the group formed a bond. It was kind of like, it's a secret club because nobody wants, you don't want anyone disappointed in you, right? You always get looks from people you know, like it, you don't really care about people you don't know. It's the people you do know. They're like, oh, wait, you're a smoker, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden it's this label. And so we were, you know, kind of hiding away from it a little bit. Two of the grad students in this little group of smokers with Sam were Adam Bowen and James Monsies. Adam was a skinny, kind of quiet guy with a high forehead and glasses who had grown up in Tucson. On his backpack was a pin for Burning Man, the annual music and art event in the Nevada desert. James had brown hair, a lot of energy. He was always sprinting up steps two at a time and a laugh that was kind of like the Count from Sesame Street. And he was, you know, he was very confident in himself. He was what, like 24, 25, really young. Um, but already pretty established in terms of a designer, having done proper need finding, industrial design, and, and product design with some consultancies. Before coming to Stanford, James had studied physics and art in Ohio, and he was a maker at heart. When Sam had mentioned he needed a bicycle, James gathered the parts and built one for him. As Sam, James, and Adam would meet out back for a cigarette break, sometimes their conversations would turn to smoking itself. It became a, an intellectual topic. Like, why do it at all? Let's break down the rituals of smoking and let's look at the history of it and how important is it to you? They thought about the images of their youth. Smoking was cinematic. I grew up watching like Hong Kong action films, John Woo uh, and Chow Yun-Fat. Chow Yun-Fat has a cigarette in his hand in every movie. And they use cigarettes as as a tool in those movies for coolness. And they'd ask themselves a common question. Like, why are we doing this to ourselves is the question, right? Um, a, it feels good. Uh, B, it's also addictive. Inevitably, they would get around to talking about their master's thesis. Every student had to come up with a final project, something they found interesting, something they wanted to make or design. The limitlessness was almost overwhelming. So they give you one year of training, they say, okay, second year, do something great. It's utterly paralyzing, right? Like what students have to learn over time is something that's, even though they want to change the world right away, you have to start with something scopable first. Students were encouraged to think big, tackle global problems. One had taken on infant mortality in developing countries. Another, solar lighting that had replaced dangerous kerosene lamps for a hundred million people. One fall day, over a cigarette, James Muncy shared an idea he'd had. The problem with smoking wasn't nicotine. It's the smoke, the byproducts of burning tobacco. That's what produces the tar that damages your heart and lungs. But what if you could get nicotine, the only thing smokers really want, without setting the tobacco on fire? The question really from James is like, why hasn't someone just come up with a, a portable vaporizer? We're in Silicon Valley. It's, it's, it's the 21st century. Like, we can do this, right? Adam was instantly on board. And as soon as the light bulb went off, the two of them started talking. I think they both realized that they couldn't pull this off just with one person, the kinds of technology they're going to put together uh, with this thesis. These guys, they're not like super ambitious, right? But they're brilliant. And when there's a good idea that can, you know, they really help a lot of people, they're for it. Sam watched as James and Adam began to talk excitedly about how this could work. Talking about these ideas and really working out some of the initial fundamentals of the thermodynamics, how much heat would you require, what is the substrate going to heat up to, do you burn it, things of that nature. And they're like, we can do this, we can totally do this. I just took a puff of my cigarette, I'm like, cool, I can't wait. <laughs> James and Adam got to work. They set out to create something compact and convenient, something that would look attractive and taste great for smokers. They spent a year pulling late nights, tinkering with designs, researching existing vaping technology, and getting friends to test out different prototypes. And then one night in June of 2005, they were ready to present their thesis. Inside a campus lecture hall, James and Adam's classmates, along with Stanford faculty, sat waiting. With the lights dimmed, James and Adam stood at the front of the room with a large screen between them. The first slide appeared. It said, Plume, the rational future of smoking. Plume, spelled with two O's, like Bloom. So the name was Salas. Uh, it's now 
bloom, at least temporarily. Uh, so Adam and I were interested in uh, working on design for social change. And we acknowledged right away that smoking was probably an easy target. Uh, One image showed Sam blowing smoke. Smoking, but at the same time, every cigarette is really self-destructive. So clearly there's room for improvement in the overall experience. <laughs> Um, it's also a large market, so there's potential to, um, to have some real change. He clicked to the uh, next slide, which showed a baby sucking on someone's finger. Humans like putting things in their mouths. And then he got around to talking about the cigarette itself. It's actually quite amazing. But in reality, um, the cigarette is actually a carefully engineered product for nicotine delivery and addiction. He explained that the tobacco people smoke in traditional cigarettes is filled with waste stems and literally hundreds of additives. And of course, health warnings, which have made it harder for smokers to ignore what they're doing to themselves. This is a warning that appears on cigarette packs in uh, both Europe and Canada. It tells you about uh, oral cancer, lung cancer, emphysema, etc. But it really puts smokers in the position of either quitting the enjoyable, otherwise enjoyable habit um, that they have, or becoming a sort of hardcore smoker where they um, are forced to be ignorant of the, the, uh, the side effects. James played a clip to show how smokers have been increasingly stigmatized. A clip from South Park. Well, that's the end of our tour. In it, the kids have been taken to the Museum of Tolerance to teach them a lesson. Now do you see why tolerance is so important, boys? I guess we have to accept people for who they are and what they like to do. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Oh, I was just, uh... There's no smoking in the museum! But I'm not in the museum. Get out of here, you filthy smoker! Yeah, dirty lungs! <laughs> Go ahead and kill yourself, stupid tar! Everybody laughed. Then James asked the audience a serious question. I mean, what if smoking were safe? And even better, what if smoking were actually not offensive to others as well? It turns out that actually burning tobacco is the real problem. Uh, nicotine's addictive, clearly, but it's not the nicotine that's really hurting you. So it's, um, it's mostly the combustion that's the problem. Big tobacco companies were not unaware of this, James explained. They, they realized that they're killing off their own client base, um, so they sunk uh, several billion dollars into this already. But the problem, he said, was that none of that money had produced anything that had caught on. No product replicated the experience that smokers were used to. So our goal was to basically create a whole new experience uh, for people that retains the positive aspects of smoking, like the ritual and everything, uh, but makes it as healthy and socially acceptable as possible. As healthy so, and socially acceptable as possible. What they'd come up with was a portable vaporizer that could heat a tiny pod of tobacco. Feel that we could take tobacco back to being a luxury good, and not so much a sort of drug delivery device that, that cigarettes have become. James and Adam ended their presentation with their first satisfied customer. This product is the greatest thing I've ever encountered in my life. I, I honestly have to say that the peach strawberry flavor makes me feel like I'd like to smoke something a little bit more manly. But once I decided to smoke with enthusiasm and develop an eating habit that will follow me to my grave. Following him to the grave but maybe not putting him there. The message about what Plume could do for smoking was clear. It needed a makeover, a reconstruction from the ground up that would transform the cigarette into an almost unrecognizable new form. Unrecognizable except for the nicotine. Mental Health Awareness Month is a worthy thing to celebrate, but it shouldn't be our focus just for the month of May. It's important to be working on your mental health all year long. The positive effects of therapy can create lasting change in all areas of your life, your relationships, your career, and your overall happiness. A therapist can help you identify the habits and patterns that might be holding you back and how to move forward in the right direction. If you're thinking about starting therapy, you should check out our sponsor, Talkspace. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day. Send text, video, or voice messages to your licensed therapist. Incredibly convenient virtual sessions from the comfort of your home. 
Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. So instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7, and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com and make sure to use the code VAPING to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's code VAPING, V-A-P-I-N-G, at Talkspace.com. George Kimball is a founder of the Stanford Design School, a young man but balding with a serious pair of sideburns. When I first heard of that premise, it felt very potent. You're like, wow, yeah. He'd gotten to know James and Adam over the course of their time at the university, and he admired their drive. I could really feel the commitment they had to creating something that was really well designed that would be meaningful people, that could really make a dent in in saving lives. D-school students were taught to tackle big, messy problems, take risks. It was clear that it was going to be fraught with challenges because of its provocative nature. And I think often that prevents us from actually doing good in areas that might be otherwise provocative. And so I think that's what they were stepping out to do. George kept in touch with James Monsies and Adam Bowen even after they left Stanford. They set up shop in a little house just off campus, tooling prototypes. James stayed at Stanford another year as a design fellow. George would visit them from time to time to see how things were going. He was rooting for them, but he also knew that they would most likely fail. As they were starting to really make some progress on this, I think one of the bigger questions was, can you even be successful in this? So Silicon Valley is filled with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. Would you ever even dare create a startup? to go after and tackle something that's filled with entrenched type of companies like the tobacco companies. For us, funding was not as straightforward, I guess you could say. James didn't talk to me for this series, but here he is on the Founder Podcast. For us, all of that stuff was really off limits because almost all venture money, venture funds in the Valley have LP agreements that restrict investments in what could be considered vice the sort of vice space. Often that even includes things like alcohol, things like that. They needed funding, though. And so two years after that presentation to their classmates at Stanford, they were making their pitch again, this time to a couple dozen investors gathered at a Palo Alto law firm. One of them was Ralph Eschenbach. He was a member of the Sand Hill Angels, an investment group named after the fabled road that's home to some of the biggest Silicon Valley investors. They weren't wearing suit and ties. They were uh, relaxed with uh, blue jeans and a a button shirt um, with a collar and uh, comfortable with who they were and how they were presenting. James and Adam didn't know it, but Ralph's mother had died of lung cancer at the age of 67. The first um, puff she would take on a cigarette, uh, after she, especially after she hadn't had one for a while, you could just see the relaxation cover her whole body. I mean, so the whole body just relaxed with the, with that first drag on a cigarette. So when James and Adam came in to pitch their product, he found them particularly interesting. They both uh, were uh, energetic, fit, athletic. They had both talked about the fact that they were smokers, but uh, wished they weren't, and uh, were trying to figure out a way to uh, not have to uh, face the uh, shun and aversion that uh, society was placing on them as they were smoking. They showed a prototype. It was a long tube, about uh, six inches long. It was. Um, not in a very um, classy looking package at that point in time, but you could see where that could go. They explained the basic idea that instead of burning tobacco, they would heat it, releasing a nicotine infused vapor, and that this would eliminate the smoke that made cigarettes so lethal. Boy, if this, if this can do what they're claiming, it's gonna really make a major impact. It seemed like it could be a big win for medical science if we could figure out a way to um, give the same kind of smoking sensation to people, but um, not have the uh, uh, carcinogenic aspects that uh, in fact killed my mother of lung cancer. And if they could provide that kind of a feeling and response in a smoker and not have the carcinogenic uh, effects that are caused by burning, Um, that could be um, a home run. The other investors listening to the pitch weren't as impressed. Vaping wasn't a huge deal yet, and electronic cigarettes were just getting off the ground, mostly in China. 
Well, you have to uh, have to start by remembering that uh, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area and virtually nobody smokes here at all. Smoking is not uh, looked at favorably and uh, we all understand the health risks. And so as a consequence, tobacco is not looked on favorably by investors in general. You know, in the case of uh, Plume, when they came in, there were certainly investors in our group that basically said, "I'm don't even talk to me about it, I'm not interested. But Ralph was. Weeks after that presentation, on November 29, 2007, the Sand Hill Angels made Plume's first investment. A bunch of us uh, did invest, basically looking past uh, the harm that tobacco does and hoping that the um, benefits of the vaping of the uh, plume would be um, ameliorated to the extent that they would be um, a lot less and could, in fact, uh, save a lot of lives. Soon, James and Adam had enough money to rent a workspace in San Francisco. It was in a converted cannery in a part of town that was once a gritty shipping hub, but now gentrifying into a neighborhood where you could order an artisan cocktail. They shared space with other startups that were making smart military jackets and adult pleasure toys. From the outside, Plume looked like any other Silicon Valley startup. And like so many of them, they were thinking big, wanting to change the world. Except this product was playing with fire. Not too long ago, I started looking for a puzzle game that could give me a good challenge. Something that requires more than the same strategy round after round. But the more my search went on, the more I wondered if I'd ever find it. That's when I came across Best Fiends, the mobile puzzle game that always leaves my brain feeling refreshingly challenged, like it swam a few laps in the pool or got a deep tissue massage. Even better than that, after I've played a few levels, I realize I'm not thinking about my to-do list anymore. It's like a reset, a welcome pause for my brain. Best Fiends is way more fun than other matching puzzle games, the ones, you know, where all you do is smash candy over and over. In fact, it's almost too much fun, so much that you might have a hard time putting it down. Because Best Fiends has literally thousands of fun puzzles to solve. I'm on level 53 right now, and there's no end in sight. The team at Best Fiends puts out updates all the time, so there's always something new to play, and the adorable, collectible characters just keep coming. It's going to be hard to choose your favorite. Download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Kurt Sonderegger walked into the lobby of a swanky San Francisco hotel in mid-2007. He was there for a job interview for a startup he'd never heard of with two guys he didn't know. Kurt was a dedicated surfer with dyed blonde hair and a perpetual five o'clock shadow. He worked for Red Bull, the energy drink company, heading up something called culture marketing. Which is everything non-sports, art, music, dance, fashion. Out of the blue one day, Kurt got a message over LinkedIn asking if he'd be interested in working for a company called Plume. He was intrigued. And that's how he came to meet two somewhat unshaven guys waiting for him at a table in a San Francisco hotel. Dressed kind of like a cross between Patagonia and, you know, I don't know, just kind of that outdoor San Francisco style where it's, it's not preppy, it's not hipster. Kurt pulled out a chair and went to sit down. I went to grab my phone and whatever else was in my pocket and I accidentally took out my phone and a pack of cigarettes. That normally would have been a pretty big gaffe. You don't really want to know someone you're interviewing with that you smoke. But I saw both of their eyes kind of light up. Uh, I think to them it signaled that I understood the problem with tobacco and would be more apt to join two guys looking to, uh, you know, overturn the tobacco industry. Kurt took the job. It was a pretty severe pay cut, and there wasn't even a product yet, only some crude prototypes and computer renderings. But as a smoker, he believed in the mission. On his first day, the three of them piled into a rented van and drove to Home Depot. They bought supplies to make desks. James had an old beater car. Then he drove, uh, I think Adam, the same thing. So they, it was, they were completely, uh, you know, unpretentious. And I, I would say that there wasn't a lot of 
ego as well. They're quite different in some ways. Adam is a little bit more kind of warm and fuzzy and friendly. James is super smart, but sometimes can not necessarily be as warm and, and friendly. He's very focused on whatever he's doing at hand. He could work, you know, three days straight on one of the problems he's trying to solve. Uh, I literally would see him sometimes. He hadn't left the office in a day or two because he's trying to solve some engineering problem. At the office, Adam was in charge of HR and paying the bills. James worked with two engineers to get the product ready. The small team all worked in the same area, the engineers assembling and testing prototypes, turning elegant designs into something you could touch and hold. There were pieces of metal and plastic scattered across the large tables. Adam, meanwhile, was experimenting with flavors. Flavors had been a part of the plan since Plume was a grad school idea in James and Adam's heads. Sometimes I would show up in the morning at my desk and there'd be 10 pods labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Please try these and let me know what you think. It was Kurt's job to drum up interest in the device. I think their hypothesis was that they weren't really going after, uh, you know, old, grizzled, two-pack-a-day Marlboro smokers. They were actually going after social smokers and lighter smokers who weren't as addicted to nicotine as, let's say, someone who's uh, a heavy smoker and had been smoking a long time. They didn't have a lot of cash for marketing or advertising. They certainly couldn't buy expensive ads. So they relied on guerrilla marketing and word of mouth. You know, like Red Bull which is exactly what got Danielle Cohen's attention at a party in San Francisco's financial district in 2009. She had long, dark, wavy hair. In a sea of black ties and designer gowns, she spotted a man dressed casually in a jacket with zippers. He seemed out of place. He looked cool and he looked, well, he was definitely doing something rebellious. It looked like he was smoking. I was a smoker. He can't smoke in the Bentley Reserve. Through the crowd, she made her way over to him. He introduced himself. He said his name was Kurt Sonderegger. And she asked him, are you smoking? He actually pulled it apart and showed it to me. Showed me how it worked, where the heating mechanism was, where the pod that contained the tobacco was. It kind of looked like a pen, but I could tell that what looked like smoke, but was actually vapor coming out of it. His device only heated tobacco. She was intrigued. He told her that he worked for Plume, the company that made the thing, doing marketing. It seemed like their mission was to help people stop smoking, which I definitely wanted to do. Soon after meeting Kurt, she came in for a job interview with James and Adam. And they asked a lot about my experience with my company, which involved fashion designers and models and runway shows, etc. And I think that we were all making the connection that I could create basically a team of hot girls that could go around promoting this product. At first, she was only working with Kurt, but soon she brought on someone else. It was like entering the cool kids club. Michelle Salta was a bullseye for Plume's target audience. Young, smart, attractive, easy to talk to. I was like entering some some cool hipster lab. Adam and James, she recalls, both appreciated craftsmanship and beauty. Like one time. I was wearing these bracelets and Adam commented on them and said, oh, those are so beautiful. Where'd you get them? And I was like, oh, they came from the Philippines. I should get your wife one the next time I come back. And then James <laughs> took a closer look at it. Said, oh, can I see that? So I took off my bracelet. Oh, OK. So this is enameled. And I can see where they overlaid the gold filling on the brass. Like, you know, he literally took my thing and took it apart and told me how it was made. And they were ready to change the world. They saw Plume as their opportunity to realize what is called a triple bottom line, which means good for the company, good for people, and also good for the environment. It was their way of being idealistic. Like, can we preserve something that is good about uh, a habit that is bad and make some money doing it? When they explained that to me, I was like, holy shit, like, dang, I wish I thought like that. Michelle and Danielle, along with other friends they recruited, started setting up plume tasting stations at some of the trendiest spots in San Francisco. We basically, you know, took over that table in the back of the bar and set out all of our plume materials 
and just kind of waited for people to come hang out at the back of the bar with us. We wanted tastemakers. We wanted influencers. We wanted people that other people looked up to for the choices that they made. And once the trays caught customers' attention, they were hooked by the futuristic look of the device. A lot of people said, I was like, oh my God, it's just like an iPod. It's designed like an iPod. It's like a cigarette iPod. And what they meant by that was like, it's just a super cool, sleek design. The trays contained a rainbow of tobacco pods, each about the size of a pencil eraser. Customers would come up, see the pretty bright colors, and then choose the pod that they wanted to try, put it in the device, put on the clean mouthpiece, and experience their first vaping experience. They would say, oh my God, thank you for a chocolate cigarette experience. Like, oh my God, this peach, tastes delicious with my drink. It complements the wine or it complements the vodka or whatever it is. And then a lot of times they would start giving ideas for their own flavors. Bubble gum, cotton candy, strawberry, and apple, I would say were the four most requested flavors. The plume device was very cool looking. It um, looked a lot better than it worked. The design flaws that were inherent in the plume became evident through the process of going through live events and watching drunk people try to change out pods. The button you push to get the reaction started, if your finger was in the wrong place, you could get a shock. A shock or even a burn. The pods were made of aluminum, so sometimes if the mouthpiece came off, you could singe your lips on the little heated piece of metal. And perhaps most important, it didn't pack much of a nicotine punch. Often the feedback on the Model 1 was, that was cool, but now I just want a cigarette. I actually used to tape two together. <laughs> and I know that really pissed James off. I was told never to do that in public. Kurt decided he had to act. He took Adam on a lap to visit some stores. So I remember we went into this one smoke shop in Haight-Ashbury area, and it was a, most of these shops are owned by a Middle Eastern guy, and of course they, they all really know hookah and they sell. Kurt slapped the Plume Model 1 onto the counter. Instead of you know me getting everything ready and just firing it up and putting it in his hand and saying, here, try this, I, we just put it down, I explained how it worked, let him put the butane in, and try to start it, which of course he got a shock. He finally got it going. The mouthpiece came off and he burned his lip. Adam realized what they were facing. Years of work up in smoke. I think he just, it really hit home. My God, you know, we definitely need to go back to the drawing board and, and try to fix this. They redesigned the product. They ditched the butane and used a battery. If we can't offer a better product experience than ones that have existed for hundreds of years, then we're not a very good innovation company. A few years later, in 2012, they finally had their first big success with a vaporizer called the PAX, which was about the size of a harmonica. They made a vaporizer they hoped would appeal to the millions of people who couldn't stop smoking. But the PAX was actually a seller because people were using it for marijuana, not because it was providing a healthier alternative to cigarettes. George Kemble had taught them and other founders who'd come from Stanford, when you tackled big problems, you always had to consider something else. And that is everything we do has unintended consequences. Head down one path and you may find yourself in an unexpected destination. But George says, you can't let that stop you. And the question is, when we put things out in the world, are we paying enough attention as things unfold to see what those are, to see the intended consequences and then to pay attention to what unexpected is emerging? And fear is probably one of the biggest barriers to actually creatively solving problems. James and Adam hadn't let fear stop them from taking on a major killer and a powerful industry. But what they didn't know was that unintended consequences would nearly cost them everything. Coming up on this season of The Vaping Fix. They needed a way for this small battery to deliver the maximum satisfaction, and they found it with nicotine salts. When I tried this, I just, I kind of just lost myself for about three seconds. I said, I don't ever have to smoke another cigarette ever again. This is just mind blowing. I told my friends too, I was like, yeah, like I just can't stop with this anymore. My friends are like, yeah, me neither. Honestly, we didn't see it coming. Not after the numbers were, were going down or leveling off for, for two years. It's like, Jesus Christ, what were we thinking?
From Wondery, this is episode one of six of The Vaping Fix. This is a series about what happens when the spirit of innovation collides with greed, politics, and the unforgiving reality of addiction. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Episode two is available now, or you can listen to the first three episodes ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. You can follow the show on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, and the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey. The Vaping Fix is written and reported by me, Laura Beal. Associate producer is Denise Chan. Fact-checking by Jacqueline Coletti. Additional production assistance from Daniel Gonzalez. Managing producer is Lata Pandya. Music supervisor is Scott Velasquez. Sound design by Jeff Schmidt. Executive producers are George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Jen Sargent for Wondering.